Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We're here for part two. We spent part one talking about Cuba in the last hundred years. Um, and one of the um, big things that we saw and recognized was a turbulent history um, and interaction with the US, um, specifically dur during the Cold War and um, the rise of and continuation of the rule of Fidel Castro. Now, um, what's important for understanding the uh, most popular uh, Cuban musical export, which was dance music, which caught on big time um, mid-century, uh, we need to understand where this dance tradition came from and um, who started it and why it was so big in Cuba to begin with. Um, to do that, we need to go um, it, it turn our attention to pre-1900 musical activities um, and understand what was happening in Cuba. And um, the big interest, like I said, in Cuba was its um, potential for resources and its um, contributing factors to economic growth of other countries that had, had a hand in uh, Cuban wielding and dealings. Um, so to talk about that specifically, the big economy that was there was sugar. And um, in or sugar was a very labor intensive crop. And uh, when you have the necessity for labor, especially pre 1900s, you usually have the occurrence of slavery also happening. Um, the transatlantic slave trade, which is something that we had already um, discussed in a previous lecture, is going to have a major impact as well on Cuba. Um, so the musical cultures of Cuba's slaves and their descendants are more closely linked to their African origins than those in the United States. Uh, the differences are really due to the dynamics uh, of the transatlantic slave trade and the conditions of slavery in the, or in the Spanish colonies compared to North America. Um, simply put, Africans in North America had a longer and more forced period of um, uh, being accumulated into society and culture, whereas slaves in Cuba and from Africa at a later date were less subjugated to, to that and had closer ties with African cultures. So um, bringing that point home, this idea that, you know, we, we talked about the transatlantic slave trade in regards to another musical import of the South and talking about the emergence of gospel, um, and the reluctance initially of incorporating um, slaves into the practiced religion at the time. And that was going to be a major difference in Cuba. Um, so speaking of the African slave trade, um, the destination to Cuba began in the 16th century on a very, very small scale. Uh, but before 1840, most of slavery in Cuba was domestic rather than agricultural. Uh, nearly all Africans brought to Cuba uh, were males between 15 and 20 years of age, making impossible a family-based regeneration model to maintain a slave population. Um, Instead, newly enslaved Africans were needed to replace those who had died and those who had worked to death on sugar plantations. In the United States, on the other hand, slaveholders found it more economical to create a slave class through domestic regeneration, and um, that was going to create a longer established running history of slavery. So we have these two major deviation points. Um, and unlike institutional slavery in the United States, many Cuban slaves could work part-time on their own, purchase their freedom, eventually become wealthy, um, so that there actually developed a sizable urban black bourgeoisie in the 19th century Cuba. And that was unheard of really in the United States. Um, in Cuba specifically, slaves lived and worked outside of cities and neighborhoods of the Spanish population. Um, they were not likely to be exposed to Spanish culture for the most part, and they were able to develop cohesive communities, unlike slaves 
um, in the US who worked on small scale plantations, other southern US slave states. Um, so again, major differences here, and that's going to create a big change when it comes to the arc and development of music very specifically. Um, so, sorry, what was, uh, good. Um, so Africans in Cuba um, also retained their religious practices, talking about the idea and importance of religious beliefs by blending things in with Catholicism um, and in incorporating their symbols and um, uh, important icons into the culture that they were being asked to assimilate to. Um, in the United States, by contrast, slave owner owners made seriously every single effort humanly available to destroy native culture, language, and to separate family members. Um, drumming and dancing and singing were prohibited. The, um, the ring shout was not something that um, was done publicly in the presence of um, white slave owners. Um, remember that there were a number of instruments that were also prohibited at this time. Um, but even so, they were able to, you know, we discussed this with the ring shout, you know, um, congregate in a meaningful way to continue um, expressing their um, sense of community. Uh, but it was much easier to do in Cuba, on the other hand. Um, so as I've sort of been trying to get to, and we're going to cover it a lot in parts three and four, Cuba is really the origin of a lot of world's famous, most famous dance music and most well-known dance music, like the rumba, son, bolero, salsa, mamba, cha-cha-cha, timba. Um, those are only to name a few. Those are big, huge categories that have lots of subcategories at this point. Uh, and Cuba's influence on Latin music is pervasive throughout the Spanish speaking cultures of Central and South America as well. Um, so again, talking about the music of the slaves before 1900 and setting the stage for dance being an important element that accompanies music. Um, contemporary Cuban music was forged in the slave cultures of the island. Um, and slaves in Cuba came to different uh, regions, but shared really two main things. One was religious beliefs held drumming, dancing, and singing as sacred, and the idea of two poly music, uh, polyrhythmic music was going to be at the core of that expression. Um, for a variety of reasons, Cuban slaves were able to continue, modify, conceal, or disguise their danced religions of Africa. Um, much better than in the United States. Um, Cuban dance in, evolved from the unique per percussive instruments and rhythms of those, um, those religious practices into the dance forms that we know and adore today. Um, of the things that we're going to hear that are similar between our history and trajectory of and development of gospel and with Cuban music is this practice of call and response or heterophonic texture is really going to come to the fore. Um, so drumming, polyrhythm, and how it applies to music. Um, this, uh, a, a lot of the initial musics that we listen to have a major em emphasis on percussion. And when percussion is the element that is emphasized when you have more than one instrument participating in creating the um, metric fabric of a piece, you encounter poly, many metric meters in, in a piece. So polymetric music is going to be um, uh, more prevalent here, especially when we're considering uh, music that is just instruments that are percussion. Why? Well, when you're dealing with just percussive elements, you are uh, taking out the instrument that is um, making melody, right? So 
The most common texture that we hear in music is homophonic texture, melody, main thing, accompaniment, secondary thing, or the thing that supports the main thing. When you just have rhythm, you sort of start equaling the playing field. Everyone is equally important. And therefore, when you cannot create this hierarchy, you're kind of left with polytextural pieces of music. Um, and that's because you can't, again, delineate which one, is, which voice is more important or which one is less important. Um, in any case, um, Africans who were brought to Cuba during the transatlantic slave trade came in three major groups, and each group came from a different part of the west coast of Africa, Africa and brought its own major cultural identity. Drums, call and response, singing, dance, and religious ritual blended in these three cultures, especially as they were uh, imported to a different location. Um, so we have lots of, um, uh, of focuses on these particular elements. Uh, the first group who arrived in the early colonial period were the Bantu speaking people of the Congo region. Um, their ceremonies involve lots of drumming, singing, dancing, call and response, um, ancestral and ceremonial drums. Um, and uh, we're gonna hear those influences very strongly in a number of uh, the musical examples in parts three and four. Um, the second area, uh, the second group of African slaves were the Karabali, um, and the, it's close to Nigeria. Um, and they formed a secret male fraternity called the Abakau. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that quite right, but the members converse in a secret, secret language um, whose performances um, by this group that I'm about to play you uh, are incredibly legendary and they are important in the establishment and the development of rumba. Um, so this is a modern performance of an older musical style um, that was uh, in use between 1821 and 1840. So talked for a while. Let me go ahead and pull up our first listening example.
what's happening here. Um, we have a, kind, a strong call and response relationship between a lead singer and the rest of the ens uh, ensemble of vocalists. And then underneath them, a um, constantly evolving, very um, movement oriented, multi-layered rhythmic accompaniment that's being played on um, bongos, conga. We're gonna talk about some of these instruments, but they are hand drums at the very least. And um it's accompanied with of course a ritual dance that we are that we are seeing that is part in reenacting a narrative that's being described by our uh our leader of the group and we're going to hear a lot of these things carried over in a number of our traditions of dance music from rumba and son and beyond that we have a um, someone that's in a leadership position doing a call, a kind of response from some vocalists. Guess what? We saw that um, in, in a little bit in mariachi of um, the regional musics of uh, Mexico. Um, we also heard it in um, the predecessors of gospel music as well. So um, where we're encouraging a sense of community and a sense of participation with a call and response texture that's built into the piece. Another kind of community driven aspect of this is the idea that the percussive instruments um, were things that were practical on, on the occasion. Um, claves are literally two pieces of wood that you smack together and they are the basis of all of these dance music music traditions that we are going to talk about shortly. I um, want to discuss the third wave of African slaves uh, from Yoruba, um, which is southern day Nigeria. So our, our previous um, uh, wave of slaves came from close to Nigeria, but not quite Nigeria proper. They were imported from 1851 to 1860, and they were there to expressly work on sugar plantations. Large scale sugar production demanded intensive mass labor. And Cuba had not witnessed the brutality of such slavery on such a scale previously. As in Haiti and Brazil, slave drivers on the sugar plantations worked slaves to death. Uh, because the supply of slaves was plentiful and relatively cheap, they could simply be replaced, which is horrific. Um, the Yoruba maintained their religious practices by mixing and distinguish or disguising them within the bounds of Catholicism. Um, their religious system is known today as Santeria, which probably is a familiar term, although you might not know exactly what Santeria is. Uh, it shares uh, with Paula Monte a sacred drum song tradition uh, that many of the same or similar divinities um, known in Santeria uh, as Orishas. Um, so we're gonna have, again, in Africa, because a lot of these communities are close together, there are definitely regional differences, but um, we're going to see a number of similarities as well um, from these traditions. So I wanna play you um, an example of a bata drum. And uh, this video that I'm gonna show you, uh, the participants are, um, uh, in the ceremony sing while the bata uh, drummers are playing this very complex rhythmic pattern. Um, and during the performance of this piece, um, there would be three figures that would be dressed in red and white and um, would wield a sword or an axe. Um, the dancers and uh, participants in the ceremony would become possessed. Uh, Santeria uh, often um, is associated with this idea of possession um, sometimes. Um, but uh, the, um, the religion of Santeria is still actually practiced in Cuba today, uh, not only by Blacks and um, in Cuba, but also in Puerto Rico and Mexico and Colombia the Dominican Republic, Venezuela, the United States, and elsewhere. So um, it's not confined to this region alone. Um, but what we're going to hear in this example is a rich and uh, diverse percussive layer 
um, that is going to be a part of a number of Centuria um, rites and uh, musical accompaniments. So let me go ahead and pull up the bata for us. <laughs> there was a second um, performer that was being possessed as well. Um, and uh, these music and dance interactions happen for a lengthy period of time. That was just a small snippet. Um, but notice that there's a call and response texture that's happening with the other participants in addition to that rich uh, layer of different rhythms that are happening from the drum accompaniment. Um, music for the bata drums alone without singing or dance is called oro seco. Um, there are three drums that are the same as those in, that are performed in the religious ceremonies, but they're not sacred um, and they haven't been blessed. So that's the big difference here. Um, the rep for oro seco uh, consists of a vast number of tropes which are associated with the particular orisha. Uh, and they're played in a particular order, but I want to play these um, percussive instruments all by their by themselves to show you just how much of a diversity of sounds and timbres that you can get from uh, instruments that are just in one single category.
fascinating performance. And one thing that I really want to drive home is this idea of texture. So our experience of texture is, um, or rather when we are trying, when we're saying something about texture, we want to talk about the ongoing number of independent layers at a particular time. And in this case, we had three independent layers. We had three layers that were equally important that were ongoing at one given time. And that reveals to us a, a polyphony of sorts. Um, and that is because we're unable to distinguish one voice or one instrument as being more important than the other ones. Um, so lots of polymetric attitude when it comes to the rhythm section of a lot of um, ritual music that was imported by slaves both to the US and to Cuba. Um, and again, this route through Cuba ended up creating major differences when it came to music. And one thing that we see that was still tied to music was the expression of dance. Um, and dance being a, um, you know, choreographed moves that are often very much tied to the sense of rhythm that is ongoing or meter that's ongoing in a piece. Um, before I close off our second section, I want to just talk very briefly about the instruments that are in the percussion section that are going to make an appearance within um, Cuban music. And Afro-Cubans invented, modified, and popularized the percussion instruments that are now really a part of the standard Latin musics and fusions. Those instruments include uh, the conga drums, the bongo, timbales, maracas, guiro, and claves. That last one, claves, makes an appearance, I think, in every single genre that we're going to talk about in parts three and four. Um, so the Congo drum um, is also, and we, we heard it um, in the uh, first example in this section, um, and actually the second example, it's uh, a drum that was invented in the 19th century by Cuban slaves working on shipyards. And it was originally an instrument that was fashioned together by piece, piecing together salvaged barrels um, that were circumvented um, during the Spanish prohibition of, um, uh, of African drums, which were carved from a single block of wood. That was the, the uh, initial um, style of African drum. Um, they're often uh, grouped in drum ensembles and they come in three different sizes and therefore three different kind of pitch ranges. Um, there's a fourth instrument that's of a contrasting timbre uh, that's usually added in uh, uh, ensembles that just make use of the conga drum, um, and that would be like a cowbell, for instance. And that's an instrument that actually helps indicate to the players what's happening within the cyclical rhythmic framework of the piece of music. Um, Congos. Uh, differ from bongos in that a bongo is, they are smaller uh, and they are an attached pair of drums. Um, there's a, uh, a larger drum that is the female drum and a smaller drum that's considered the male drum. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, the bongo was a prohibited instrument and played in secret in, until the 1940s in Cuba. Um, Afro-Cubans were really quick to transform Sp Spanish kettle drums into open bottom drums called the timbales. Uh, and the timbales are maybe instruments that you, are, you don't know of uh, immediately. Um, they are played with the sticks in a variety of positions on the drum head, in addition to the wood or the, um, the shell of the instrument. And it creates um, uh, a wild landscape of timbers that one person can tap into just playing one single instrument. Uh, let me go ahead and pull up an example of the timbales. <laughs>
some instruments here. This is a guiro, a handheld instrument. It's got like a scraper on the side. It kind of sounds a little bit like the ribbit of a ribbit, ribbit or, or of a frog, a tiny bit. These are the timbales. Um, again, what you're going to notice is that is we're striking a number of positions on the instrument, which gives us a variety of timbres. Notice that there was also a um, a metal instrument that was connected, a cowbell, a small cowbell that was connected to the timbales set. Um, we also had some maracas that were a part of our, our ongoing mix. And all of these instruments that we heard are really very typical in Latin music and very specifically Cuban music. Um, so maracas, very specifically, you hold them with your hand. They are a pair of gourds that are filled with seeds or a similar material, and they're shaken to create some rhythmic patterns. Um, so uh, the guiro, like I said, is, is a gourd shaped uh, or a gourd, a hol hollowed out gourd um, that's got ridges on one side and you play it by scraping the stick against the, the ridged side it creates some kind of rasping sound. Um, and lastly, the claves are probably the most well known of, um, of any of the Latin instruments in the percussion section. It's a super useful instrument. It was invented in 18th century Havana. Um, uh, claves, they produce a very, very distinct, dry, high-pitched click and the thing that is important about them is that click can really um, cut through very dense textures of music. Um, the short repeating clave pattern that we're going to hear in a number of these dance traditions is kind of the organizational spine of a lot of the rhythmic activity that happens in traditions like boomba or cha-cha-cha or son. Um, it's an a pattern that's also always in two measures of four over four time. So unlike some of the other traditions that we listen to that have, um, like we just stepped off of listening to um, regional music of, of Mexico, where we heard a lot of simple compound time. In this case, we're going to listen to a lot of simple time. Um, it, this cl a clave pattern, which can be different in, um, a number of different uh, is different in a, num in a number of different musical uh, dance traditions, meaning that like the song has a particular clave pattern associated with it. The rumba has a particular clave, associ uh, clave pattern associated with it. Um, an example of a clave pattern in involves the habanera. Um, and this that that pattern um, uh, is going to be really persistent in habaneras. Uh, there's a very famous habanera that is a part of an opera, um, Carmen, that uses this pattern. Um, I think for sake of time, I'm not gonna play it for you, but um, the point is that there are a number of different clave patterns that we're going to hear and the different clave patterns to us often indicate a different style of dance. So um, for parts three and four, we're going to take a look at all of these different genres of dance that are popularized um, in Cuba and make their way over to the United States in the mid-century. Um, and again, just to kind of wrap our part two up in a neat bow, one of the things that we're going, that we have seen here is a, um, again, influence of African music as imported by a long withstanding slave community, but the US and, um, and Cuba, they go off in two very profoundly different directions. As we saw in the sense of gospel, um, we 
we stuck around with a strong emphasis on call and response textures when it, and high levels of syncopation. Um, however, uh, in Cuban music, we're going to hold tightly to our tradition of incorporating movement with music. And that's going to inform a number of the other um, uh, musical characteristics like timbre and texture and harmony and rhythm and um, meter and form. Um, so I'm looking forward to dissecting a bunch of different uh, genres of dance music uh, with you when we return for our part three. Um, this would be a good time to get your dancing shoes on. So see you for part three shortly. <laughs>